Well, good evening. You're awake. Always wonderful to be here, of course, whenever I get the opportunity. And so it's great to be able to share with you tonight. And of course, in a little while, you'll be having communion together. And as I was thinking and praying about things to share with you tonight, I wanted to pick a topic, or I, I guess you might call it a topic, a Bible study, uh, on a specific subject that I think is a wonderful preparation for communion. And uh, it's, it's a word study, I suppose you could say. And uh, it's, one, it's one of these words uh, that I think for the average person, when you even hear the word, it's perhaps one of the most disliked words in vocabulary. I suppose. People are very uncomfortable. It's very misunderstood. The word oftentimes when you hear it, it's almost like, you know, somebody running their fingers down, you know, a chalkboard or something. Uh, and, and it's a tough one. But yet it's one of the most wonderful words in all of human vocabulary. And the word is guess. That's the word guess. The word is guess. No, the, uh, the word, <laughs> the word is repentance. And it's one of these words that it's interesting because, like I say, it's one that many people are very uncomfortable. We get this picture, you know, of some cogity old bearded guy, you know, in the old, you know, prophet's robes and sandals marching down the street with a big placard that says repent or turn or burn or, or whatever else so often. And you get this picture. But the word is one that I think when, when truly understood, it's a key to great blessing, to great rest, to great joy. Uh, to great victory within our life. The word, met, or the word uh, for repentance is, comes from a Greek word, metaneo. But the word is very simple. All the word means is to think differently, or to think afterwards, or to reconsider. In other words, if somebody, when somebody is repenting, as far as the Bible is concerned, they've, been, they've thought one way, and then one day they realize, you know something? I don't think that way anymore. They think differently. Or they think afterwards, they go through something and they, they believe something, they act it out, they act on it, they live that behavior, and then they look at it and think, I wouldn't do that again. That's repentance. Or they find themselves there that they, that they think afterwards and they reconsider. We look back at our life and you say, you know, as I look at a lot of events, if I was given, I would, I, I would reconsider the way I went through it. I was wrong. I would do differently. I'm hearing a buzz. Is that me? I'm a very powerful person, you know. The, I don't, well, anyway, I mean, but, but the word, is my phone on? Could that do it? Or is it a piece of equipment up here? It's, you know something, it's always somebody in the choir. <laughs> But the word in the Bible, it's all the way through it. It's a very key word. The Old Testament leaders and the patriarchs repent. John the Baptist, through many times, repent. Jesus, repent. Uh, Peter at Pentecost, priests repent. Uh, you look there throughout the book of Acts and in the epistles. In Luke chapter 15, it tells us angels delight in repentance. Paul preached repentance. The early church preached repentance. In the book of Revelation of the seven letters of the seven churches to five of the churches, the Lord told them, repent. And so what does it mean? Such a key word, so much a part of, of, of life as far as God's concerned. What is God saying when he looks at somebody and says, I want you to repent. I want to give you this word. I want you to apply it to your life. I want you to discover what it can mean to you when you treasure the word, you understand the word. I am giving you the opportunity, he hands us this gift, and he says that at any point you want, you, in your life you want, you can think differently. You can stop thinking that way and say, you know something, I want to think differently. I want to reconsider. I want to change my mind about that. It's a wonderful thing, you know, to be able to do such a thing. A lot of the world doesn't have that. Many people in the world, when they're wrong and they failed and do that, you know, something wrong, because they don't have the word in their vocabulary. They don't have something, I was wrong. I changed my mind. Many people, they do something and then they defend it. And they defend the undefendable many times. How many times in our life have we done something, we look back at it, we realize, that was not really the smartest thing I've ever done. We would look back maybe at it, but somebody else says, well, look what you did. You should have done that. And then all of a sudden we defend it. 
Well, you'd have done it if you were in my place. Or, you know, what's, you know, or we explain, well, I had to do it because of the fact that this and this and this happened. And we have to justify it or explain it. And we run at the mouth for 10 minutes on a thing. Meantime, everybody around looks at it and realizes you are wrong and you can't admit it. But the wonderful thing is God actually gives this treasure to somebody. He says, you know something? Anytime you want to, you can look and say, you know something? I'm wrong. It's a complete answer. Have you ever talked to somebody and you're upset or about them? You know, you did this and you did this and you did this and you did this and I've got the proof and other people know about it. And we've got this down and this and such and such. And then the person looks at it and says, you know something? You're absolutely right. I was wrong. Yeah, but you. What? Yes, I was. But I mean, we want it. We're all ready for a fight. But when somebody says I was wrong, it's a complete answer. It's a wonderful solution. How do you now say yeah, but you? Do you mean that? Yes. Yeah, I, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, but everybody. Yeah, I know they were all right. I was wrong. Oh, OK. But they don't know what to do with it. Well, when somebody repents, there's four categories or areas to me that, that repentance covers. When somebody says, I want to change my mind. One of the very first areas that a human being, God calls us to repent about is, number one, to change our mind about God. To change our mind very simply about who he is and his right to rule within our lives and having a right appreciation, a right knowledge of who God is. You know, we come into the world, I suppose that nobody in all of human history has ever received more bad press than God. Virtually anything and everything that seems to go wrong in people's lives or in the world, in an event, somehow or another, God's responsible. God did this. Why? How could a God of love? And he gets all the blame, all the bad press of which he has nothing to do with it, but nonetheless, he gets blamed for it. You know, here on one hand, the Bible tells us when man sinned, Satan actually there, the deceiver, he's the one that came in, the father of all liars. He now came in, he deceived, he usurped an authority that wasn't his, he took over and, you know, and became the prince of the power of the air when man fell. He became, as, God, as the Bible says, the God of this world. John says in the New Testament, the whole world lies in the arms of the wicked one. And yet he is doing we, all these things behind wars and rumors of wars, all of these attacks, all of this hatred, all this stuff that everybody, you know, the devil now, <laughs> he can't manage the world. He has no love. He has no administrative powers. He has no care for people, has no capacity to help a government, help a nation, help people. He just wants to rule over. He's the prince of the power of it. He governs it. He wants it all, but he can't help it. He has no love, no wisdom, no understanding, no gentleness. None of the things that are needed to make life sustainable under his rule. So when everything, anything goes wrong, he just turns around and he says, blame God. You know, <laughs> it's all God's fault. If God loved you, I mean, here he, he doesn't take credit for anything himself. He doesn't look there and say, yeah, I did it. I'm responsible. It's my world. But nonetheless, he blames it all on God. And a lot of people have believed that. All the press. How many areas sometimes of our lives have we got something where we have an entirely wrong attitude towards God? About who he is, about his love, about his power, about his wisdom, about his patience, his kindness, his gentleness. So many of us, we've got an entirely wrong thought about God. And at least, at the very least of all, we have a small I, you know, uh, thought about God. We think of God way too small in terms of his majesty and his power and his glory and the immensity of who he is. But God, he's very patient with us and he comes to us and he'll spend years with us helping us just, number one, change our mind about him. I love it when Jesus met Peter and Peter wanted to follow him and he would, you know, threw his nets aside and I'm ready to go follow you. But yet Peter still had a very narrow opinion, essentially, of who God really was and his right to rule. Peter was always trying to assert himself, telling Jesus what to do, how to do it, correcting anything. He was bigger and wiser so often in so many of his ways, even though Jesus so patient with him, so gentle with him. Sometimes Peter would just force his way in and try to rule him. And then Jesus actually turned out and had to say, get thee behind Satan, me Satan, you're an offense. Here, I mean, even the devil, when he could even so take over Peter sometimes, Peter had to be put in his place. Jesus could do that, but still was so patient. Waiting for people to, for Peter to come to a true, full appreciation of who he was. The same thing happens over and over. You look at Saul of Tarsus, a pathetically angry man, hostile, hardened man, until, of course, when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And here he thought he knew who God was. He, th he, had, he thought he knew what God was, was all about. 
And all his own understanding of God did was make Paul or Saul of Tarsus at the time an angry man, a vengeful man, a bitter man. You know, murdering people in the church, making orphans out of children, widows out of women. As he got people literally in his anger and his hostility and his entirely wrong idea of who God was. He's getting people to deny Christ and blaspheme him and then would put them to death still. Had many imprisoned. And yet they're finally on the road to Damascus when Jesus himself knocked, you know, Saul of Tarsus off his high horse. Blinds him. Anyway, and he, though he can't see, he doesn't know who he's talking to, but he realized whoever he is, he says, who art thou, Lord? He said, you're Lord. Uh, that's agreed. We settled that one, you know, with the Beruario. I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Is it hard for thee to kick against the goads? He looked at him and he said, the, the, I, I, you know, you think you're persecuting and all these other people. It's me. It's me you don't understand. Isn't it hard for you to live the way you're living? Aren't you getting tired of it? Isn't it exhausting to live the way you live? You've got such a wrong idea of who God is and who Jesus is. And how many of our problems in life are directly related to our, our incorrect view of God or who he is? Just today, I got a letter from a lady that I've, I've got to respond, and hopefully I can open up some doors of communication with her. But I married or did perform the ceremony in 1973, 40 years ago. And here she recited some things that when we had some premarital counseling, I was one that did some premarital counseling, I guess, along with others. But she felt at the time it was entirely inadequate. They were such young Christians. And of which back in the 40, 40 years ago, in the early part of the Jesus movement, back at Calvary and Costa Mesa was where I was at the time. And there were, we had five, six weddings a week and at least that. And they're coming to Christ at huge numbers, and there's a lot of them coming out of the hippie lifestyle and all of those things. And we're marrying them, but some of them I can remember, well, boy, this is going to be a tough one. And, uh, you know, with it, you'd look at them, and, and, and yet at the same time, here, this couple, all I know so far is they got married, and they were entirely unprepared for it, felt that they should have had better counseling is what her comment was. But in it, you know, the next thing you know, there's some alcohol going on, and then their marriage is in trouble, and then she can't have any children, and then she wanted children so bad, and when they could have children, their marriage got you know, more stress, more problems with it. Soon or afterwards, after 10 years, their marriage fell apart, drifted away. And then she goes, and because she wanted a child, and she was so afraid of getting old, never being able to have a child, not married, she went and had a child out of wedlock, just deliberately to have a child. And here is, so then, all I know is then the child grows up. And now the child has moved away and mom and daughter aren't getting along. Life is a mess. But the whole three, then she comes down with the analysis, you know, where's God? She's angry with God in all of this. Now, I don't know any more than that. So I've got a lot more to find out before I could maybe have a real good view. But one of the things that I think we, we, that you see so commonly is how many times in life, number one, you can have, you know, a, you know, a life. And, and if, you, if God isn't in the right place. You can have a lot of problems. Now, if God is in the right place, you can still have a lot of problems. I found that out. I actually married the right woman and have had a lot of problems. <laughs> I had the right children and had a lot more problems, you know, with it. No, I'm just kidding. But I mean, life is filled with problems for everybody. And yet at the same time, how, when these things come up, if we turn and we get angry and we blame God when the trials come. Then is when now we have got a wrong view of God. Something has to change where he is always glorious. He was always loving. He is always powerful. He is always supreme. That is never dependent upon my you know, situation on any given day or through any trial or through any struggle in my life. God is God and God is love and that is fixed. And as far as eternity is concerned, that's not really even up for negotiation. And the person that settles that in their mind that has that knowledge, God, you are loving. You are powerful. You are wise. And even when I don't understand it, you know, what's going on, and there's great trials that can happen. If any of you know the story of John Wesley, one of the greatest evangelists in history, his wife wanted nothing to do with Christ, nothing to do with the gospel. She would come out and literally curse while he was preaching, telling people not to listen to him. And yet people were coming to Christ. And this heartache within his life, he had to live with it. It was so deep to him while he's preaching initially in England to get away from his wife 
He comes to America to preach and brings an incredible revival to the United States. And in one sense, it was just to get away from one wretched woman. You know, sort of, you wonder how many wonderful things have done when people have just said, God, get me away from her. I'm just kidding. It can be men too. Don't get me wrong. But the, the point of it is, is that you can have a perfect relationship with God and still have imperfect things that happen in your life. You can have a wonderful, perfect relationship where Christ is supreme. He's God totally in your life. And you cannot have children. Or you can have difficulty with the children you do have. Some of our dearest friends, Mike and Pam Roselle, I know you've had Potter's Field here. But somebody we've known them, dear friends, for many years. Now they prayed and longed for children. They've never been able to have them. And one time in their struggle, God, why can't we have children? Here we see so many people, they have children. They don't seem to love them like we think we would. And then the Lord opens their heart and says, I've got millions of children that don't have parents. Millions of them. And all of a sudden, they, read, they start looking around the world and now have set up this ministry of Pottersfield Kids where thousands of children are cared for every day. They never would have been had they had children. And sometimes God he has events that happen within our life that still He is supreme. And when we sit there and realize, God, regardless of what happens, at any time in my life, what trial, what difficulty, what accident humanly you know, occurs, what, you know, what suffering, what loss of life of loved ones. But God, you, you are in a category in the, in, of, of absolute unchanging supremacy. You have the right to rule in all things that you might have the preeminence within my life. And the person who understands that who God is, he never is negotiable. It's settled within him. And that person that does himself a great favor. And if, God, if you're wavering towards God, let me tell you, you will therefore waver in everything else after him. But then when you waver with God, you know, now, you know, anything and everything will begin to be weakened and crumble. Oswald Chambers once says, conscious repentance produces unconscious holiness. And when consciously, I'm constantly one coming, God, is there anything about you I'm not thinking right about? about your right to rule, your supremacy, your love, your power, your wisdom? Have I reduced you down to a mere human? Have I, have I not listened to you? Have I not given you your right place within my heart or within my life? We do ourselves a great service to consciously, like David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When somebody just comes, God, search me. Check me through. And if you see anything in me that, that it all deviates from a right relationship with you, fix it. Let's correct it. Repentance is not only changing my mind about God, but as secondly, it means changing my, my mind about myself. You see, any time that I get Jesus in a higher in the right place, that he's more and more promoted within my heart, that he has more supremacy, that he has greater preeminence, then there's always a reciprocating Behavior, like John the Baptist you know, about Jesus, he said, he must, it says increase, I must decrease. Literally, he must go on increasing. I must go on decreasing. You see, John the Baptist realized, you know, that there for him to increase, I've got to decrease. One of the things that most all of us heard when we were in kids in school is the old mathematical equation that the whole is equal to the sum of its parts. And whatever constitutes when you have the whole, it, it, it's made up of all these things. Well, if there is something, my life, if, if it's all me and no God, <laughs> then I'm in trouble. But if I'm now I want it to be more and more God, then there's got to be less of me. You take a glass <laughs> and it's all me, but then I'm starting to change my mind about God. Now I'm also going to have to change my mind about myself. There's got to be something there that I realize when I'm looking and saying, Lord, you must be supreme. You must increase. Then we immediately have to realize in order for that to happen, something in me needs to decrease. Something in me needs to, to become less. For you to live more, something in me must die. Something of my right to rule. If I'm turning over the throne to you, if I'm giving you more authority, then there's less authority for me. And John the Baptist, he understood that. So simple. He must increase. I also know I must decrease. And just like Jesus said, whosoever humbles himself will be exalted. But whosoever exalts himself will be abased. In other words, Jesus says there, if there's less of you, there'll be more of me. If there's more of you, 
there'll be less of me. And when we realize that, and when, when we measure ourselves by God, the word, there will always be like Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, it tells us there, Isaiah tells us, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. He says, above him there were seraphims with six, they had, uh, they had six wings with twain, they covered their face with twain, they covered their feet and with twain they did fly. And they went back and forth across heaven and they shouted and they sang, you know, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty and the glory of God filled the temple. And then here after Isaiah saw the Lord, in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. But then he goes on after that and he says, then said I, woe is me. For I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. God, if I'm going to see more of you, if you're going to have more and more of that right place within my life, there's got to be less of me. And there as he looked and he saw him immediately, he realized, woe unto me. Or like even Job in the book of Job, you know, though God looked at him and he says, he's a righteous man. But then as you get through the book of Job, you also realize he also had a lot of self-righteousness. And Job would defend himself when his friends came to him and they would begin to say, Job, you've sinned. And he would say, I'm tired of this. He actually, he, they, they'd get too close to him or something or bum him out of it. He would turn and he says, you don't, you, I tell you, when I used to walk down the street, everybody would bow and give attention. I had a place of respect and honor and I earned it. And he defended himself. He defended his reputation. He spent chapters doing it. Until after all of this goes through, and all of this after all of his friends and he go back and forth for chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter when everything now is almost coming to a close. Then God speaks to Job and he spends four chapters. It's incredible when you look at it. Four chapters telling Job, go read it sometime. Job, who do you think you are? Where were you when I created the world? Well, how do you make a snowflake? How does a mother, you know, lamb give birth to a child? And he just goes through all of the aspects of creation and life and just verse after verse after verse after verse. You think you know so much. Answer me, Job. Give an answer. And here after four chapters, there's no rebuke like that in all the Bible. But at the end of it, Job says, you know, I've heard of God with the hearing of mine ear. And I've seen him with the seeing in mine eye. And I abhor myself. I repent. When somebody looks there, I change my mind. I thought I knew something of him. I thought I had him in the right place. I thought I understood God, and he did have a great understanding of him. But it doesn't mean there still isn't more and more repenting to always be doing. Repenting isn't something you do once and are done with it. There will never be a person this side of heaven that won't constantly have to re repent about God, about his glory. We've no none of us have been there. None of us have seen it. We've never entered into it. We all have a way too small appreciation of him. And thus we should always be in our life as we glow closer to him, be repenting. God, change my mind about you. Show me more of your glory. Show me more of your power. I'm anxious to repent. I'm anxious to know something. And then do that not only after I see you with the seed in mine eye and I, and I see more of you, I want to repent about myself. And then also, once somebody rechanges their mind about God, and they change their mind about, their, about themselves, they look at themselves, you know, and, and they find themselves there to be they're humble and they're broken. They don't defend themselves any longer. They realize Jesus died for me. I'm a sinner. I'm worthy of death. And, there, you know, and, and, and therefore, I, I've sinned and I've fallen short of the glory of God. And when somebody realizes that, it affects, you know, their, 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 the way they handle themselves, the way they, they, they are just around other people. Governor Neff, a former governor of the state of Texas, while he was in office, one time he went and he visited a penitentiary. And there as he spoke to the inmates uh, there and the convicts, after he had finished speaking to them, he says, you know, I'm going to remain a, for a while behind. And if there's any men here who would like to speak to me personally, I will listen to you, and I want to tell you, I, anything you say will be in confidence. Nothing will be repeated, and it will never be used against you. Well, one after another waited, and they wanted to talk to him, and they, one, they were framed up, and they were, there was some injustice, there was some judicial blunder, they had a bad lawyer, or whatever else, so they went on and on about this and that, trying to appeal to him to go do something. But then one man finally came up who sat back and waited for everyone else to be done. He came and he said, Mr. Governor, I just want to say, 
I'm guilty. I did exactly what they told me I did and what I'm sent here for. I believe I've paid for it. And if I'm ever granted the right to go free, I will do everything I can as a good citizen to prove myself worthy of mercy if I ever get it. That man was pardoned that day. You know that when we, when somebody looks and they can admit, they can see what it is that they've done, they don't have to defend it. They've changed their mind about God and they've changed their mind about themselves. It opens up the door to great and wonderful blessing. David, who did this terrible sin with Bathsheba, ended up not only a sin with her, but had her husband Uriah killed. Other men died with him, brought some judgment upon other people in the response of it. But then when Nathan the prophet came to David and he cornered him and he says, thou art the man. David turned and he says, I have sinned. And he broke. And Nathan responded to him, he says, and the Lord has forgiven your sin. You see, so much of what God is all about is to get us where we can just finally one day, I am wrong. God, I'm wrong about you. I'm wrong about myself. I wonder how many of us might be sitting here tonight in our own prison that we have built for ourselves. Protecting ourselves, defending ourselves, you know, explaining ourselves. It's not my fault. I was framed. Oh, maybe we're not in any human prison. But we're our own prison of self-justification. But when we, like David, can say I was wrong, then David said, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. God, if you do that, then will I teach transgressors thy ways. You change me. And God, I'll be able to help change other people who have sinned like I did too. What a refreshing word repentance is. Oh, hopefully we know it and we want to know it more and more and get it down. But if I change my mind about God and I change my mind about myself, then I'm also now going to change my mind about others. It's got to happen. All of these, one goes to the other to the other. You know, and that if I really have a right understanding of God and a right understanding of myself, then, the, you know, the, the, then the next thing, you know, it will change my appreciation of other human beings. When I realize God's love and his mercy to me, my sinfulness, my failure, and yet God's grace and mercy upon me, it now opens the door for me to change in so many ways. But until that happens, I won't think right about other people. If I don't have God right, I won't have myself right. And I won't have anybody else right either. Remember the story in the Gospels when one time Jesus, he came to a town and he's about to go in. The, the, the fathers of the town came out and asked him not to come. So many of the places Jesus went, there could be an uproar and arguments and the Pharisees and divisions came out of it. And there Jesus, he's about to they're go into a town and they asked him, please don't come. And so Jesus said, OK, we won't come. Well, John. Good old disciple John turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, shall we call fire from heaven to consume them? I mean, he literally there, John, he's just so incensed about the way that they were treated. Don't they know who you are? Don't they know who we are? Nobody should treat us this way. We can solve this right here and now. Nobody will ever treat us bad again. Call fire from heaven, consume the city, and we'll be on the easy road. Everywhere we go, we'll be welcomed. I'm quite sure. I mean, here, can you, I mean, did somebody, you know, shall we, I mean, here John was willing, just there, I mean, in his own frustration to wipe out an entire town, wipe out his entire city. Shall we call fire for heaven to consume them? You know, Jesus turned to him, you know, uh, two brothers, James and John, but he ended up one time, he looked at it, evidently these guys were fiery brothers. They were intense brothers because he gave him a nickname. He's the only ones there that he really kind of gave a nickname to. He called them sons of thunder. You guys, <laughs> you're, you're a couple sons of thunder. <laughs> There's a big roar all around, you know, thunder, no light, no lightning, just thunder, you know, around, just noise. You know, I mean, there, it was not a, 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 an endearing term, you know, there by any means to be called it. But here to have somebody that could be so hostile, so angry, shall we call fire from heaven? And yet, of course, as John the Baptist changed his mind, or John the Apostle, disciple became John the Apostle. He changed his mind about God, and he changed his mind about himself. He changed his mind about others. He ended up being known of all the apostles as the apostle of love. It was John who wrote in 1 John 4, 20, he says, If any man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. 
For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God who he has not seen? And he says, in this commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God loves his brother also. You change your mind about God, it'll reveal itself in your love for other people. It'll change you. Or like Peter, even after, you know, Pentecost, but you remember the story about Peter when here at the house of Cornelius in Acts 10, when here Cornelius, a Gentile, actually wanted Peter to come and to preach to him. Well, the Gentiles, the Jews, no, Christianity's for the Jews, they thought. They didn't want anything to do with the Gentiles. And here, you know, the Lord prepares Peter's heart and he's up there having a, you know, he's taking a nap and he has his dream comes down and all these unhealthy foods, unkosher foods are there to roll down. He says, rise, Peter, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, not so. I wouldn't eat any of this. It's all impure. That the Lord says, don't ever call unclean what I call clean. Here God looks at him and he says, Peter. He prepares his heart. Then he wakes up and realizes what God had told him to do. He goes to the house of Cornelius and the world has changed. It's a Gentile world is now brought into. How many of us? Maybe there's, there's people that we can look at and we're hostile and we're angry and we don't like. It can be an individual. It can be groups of people. I think one of the things that is paralyzing our country, some of the things we watch like right now, a trial going on down, you know, in, in Florida. The other day I was, you know, with a, uh, uh, at a, a hotel and there this black lady and, and her daughter who is an attorney, we get talking and I asked him, I said, what do you, I had not really followed this trial, uh, you know, that's going on with this uh, young or this Hispanic that has killed, you know, this black man and they, you know, famous now, everybody's heard about it. But there as we got talking and, you know, about this whole thing, I asked, what do you think the answer to all this is? And, you know, and they, well, it's just, well, this, and I said, no, I don't, I don't know who did it. I don't know. That's, that's, but the courts decide that. Maybe in this case, he actually didn't do it. Maybe he did. If he did, he should be judged. That's what the laws are for. But the greater thing is what's going on in our country where people actually have written off entire segments of the population. That they could look at a whole ethnic group of people and not like them and judge them. And have hatred for them. Call them names. You know, and, and to wear things that, you know, to, to realize there that, that we, within our society and within our world. But the answer to it, I mean, on one hand, you know, it was interesting because as we're talking, the lady, I really had a wonderful conversation. She was the sweetest lady. But she's asking me, she says, now why, you know, why, why are you asking this stuff? I said, I'm just curious. I just, I like talking to people. And, uh, and I said, it's kind of my job. I talk to people. I said, what, are you an attorney too? Well, no, not so much. You know, I, I, I kind of work on the defense side, I suppose. And they, I never did tell them, actually. I don't remember when it came out. Well, they came out as a Christian. But, they, but as they're going to, she says, I got you figured out. Oh, you do? Yes. You're a white, Republican, narrow-minded, Nazi, Tea Partier. I said, well, I'm white. You know, but the, uh, <laughs> you're clever on that one, but the rest of it we can discuss later. But I mean, I said, look at you. You've profiled me just like everybody's profiling. You are, and you're all upset at this. And so also, we, humanly, we can't stop this. It's only with the love of God that can this happen. To where we realize in Christ, the Bible says, there's neither Greek nor Jew, male or female, bond or Scythian. We're all one in him. But until that happens, we'll all profile. We'll all judge. We'll all be, be narrow. And the answer to this trial down there isn't to find who it is that's really innocent or guilty or, or have some riot on one side or the other. That'll never solve it. It's not until God does a work in human hearts. But so it needs to be where we find our, you know, in ourselves to change your mind about God and change your mind about ourselves, change your mind about others. And then lastly, changing our mind about our behavior. One of the things that happens if I change my mind about God, who he is and about myself, who I am, and I let him increase and I decrease, then it's going to change how I look at other people, whether it's my husband or my wife or my children or people just driving down the road when I'm going home tonight. Or wherever else, you know, these things that, that go on in life. It'll change my mind. You know, they're about, and then that will affect my behavior. There when I'm going down the road and somebody there cuts me off. Now, my, what's my behavior? 
after I, you know, God smite him in Jesus' name off the road. And, he, and then if he does it, well, hallelujah, then that might have been good. But I can pray however I want to. But my behavior, how do I respond to anybody or whatever else that, that goes on? You see, with, you know, my, my attitudes, my vocabulary, my behavior to other people around. I read a story about a man who stole an ox and he was put in stocks on display before the whole town. A friend of his came along and he asked him, he says, what have you done that you've received punishment like this? And he says, I don't know. I was just walking down the street and I saw on the ground a grass rope. And he says, thinking it was no use, I, I made the mistake of picking it up and I took it home. And he says, well, that's ridiculous. That's terrible. What in the world could be wrong with picking up a grass rope? And he said, well, there was something tied to the grass rope. He says, what's that? And he says, a very small ox. You know, but he, you know so often, I mean, he stole an ox, you know, here. And we, we just want to say it wasn't that big of a deal. And we want to explain it. No, I did wrong. I did wrong. And I take responsibility for it. I shouldn't have done it. The woman at the well who on one hand, you know, she'd had five husbands. The one whom she now had wasn't her husband either. And when Jesus brought it out to her, rather than her arguing and defending and, you know, there when he, and, and she said, well, you know, I perceive thou art a prophet. Says, well, yes, I'm a little more than that. She said, well, we know. You know, our father said we worship here. Now your father said, you say that we should worship in Jerusalem. But what do you say? And he says, woman, you know not who you worship. Time is coming, you worship him, and so God wants those to worship him in spirit and truth. And then she wants to, what, who is this? She says, I that speaketh unto thee, I'm he. And there this woman ended up leaving her water pot, ran to town, and she said to all the men of the town, come see the man who told me all I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Now, could you imagine that? Suppose you're in a little village you grow up in. You've had five husbands. The one you now have isn't your husband. Every man in town knows you. And now you go running into town and you say to the men, hey, everybody, come see the man who told me all I ever did. And the guy said, uh, I don't know you. Uh, who, uh, what? Uh, no, you, you, we don't want to know anymore. Please just run along. What are you talking like that for? <laughs> Why would you bring us something like that? And if she wasn't absolutely free of it, totally free, forgiven of all of it. Come see the man who told me all I ever did. Is it not the Christ? I've been forgiven. I've been transformed. I'm absolutely liberated. I'm not that woman anymore. You see, I've changed my mind about who God is. It's changed me about who I am. It's changed me about anybody and everybody else and my behavior. I'm a new creature. That's the wonderful thing that God wants to give to us. And sometimes when we can just look and realize I'm wrong, and so often it's just a few minutes with God that can do it. Zacchaeus, a wicked tax collector who'd ripped the people off. One time Jesus is coming to town. He's so inquisitive because he's such a little man he couldn't see, so he climbs up into a tree. Jesus passed by and looks up and he sees him. Zacchaeus, come down. I want to dine with you. Everybody, what? With him? He goes and he dines with him. And Zacchaeus changes his mind about God, about himself, about others and his behavior. And he comes out from thereafter. And Zacchaeus stood and he says, you know, he says, look, he says, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anybody else by false accusation, I want to restore it fourfold. There's a man. He changed his mind about God, about himself, about others and his behavior. God, I want it all right. I want it all right. And perhaps tonight as we take communion together, as we prepare our hearts, I'm supposed to be done for so there's time for this. But in closing, perhaps tonight, God wants to tell you, repent. As you take communion, maybe there's some specific way the Lord looks at you and says, would you please change your mind about me? You've been mad at me about things and blaming me for things. I didn't do you need to change your mind about that. And you have not given me credit for what I have done and nor given me the right place within your heart. If you repent, you'll be blessed and you put me in the right place. And maybe some of us, we defend ourselves and we argue and we protect somebody that's not worth protecting, not worth at all protecting. 
the famous book, it's been made a bunch of movies that don't bring it out. But if you've ever read the book of, the, of, of Les Miserables, and here this man, Jean Valjean, who there was a criminal and then he ends up, if you've seen even the movie or read the book, you know, that he ends up all on the run. He steals some things. A bishop, you know, catches him. You know, he gets caught, but he forgives him. And he tells him to go and to let God change his life. Well, he does. He goes in entirely changed, changes his identity, ends up becoming the mayor of a town, the most loved, you know, prosperous man, blessed everybody else around. Absolutely, you know, is completely transformed in every way. And yet as years go on, then in another neighboring town, there's an old fool that ends up that they believe that was Jean Valjean. They finally found him and for the man that did these crimes. And so he's brought in to court and he's about to receive punishment for his, you know, you know for, for the real Jean Valjean's crimes. In the meantime, he, Jean Valjean, has this terrible struggle that he has until finally he realizes he must go. And he had for this man, he can't let this man receive his punishment. So he goes in and where everybody knows him and respects him in this wonderful mayor who's done so much for everybody. But there is they're about to accuse and judge him. He stands up and he says, I am Jean Valjean. And he says to him, he says, don't take pity upon me. And he says, you may all think wonderful things about me, but there's only one that's important. And that is him. That voice must be answered. And here the whole world, if, you're, if he, he realized he couldn't live with himself, he couldn't go on living with himself, though everybody else didn't know and said, wouldn't suspect and wouldn't care and, had, and thought he was wonderful. But if there was just one in heaven that would look and say, you're wrong, he had to change his mind and he repented. And you know, when we, you know, maybe tonight, some of us could God, change me, set me free. I don't like this prison I'm in. Forgive me. I'm wrong. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you, dear Lord, for your goodness to us. Lord, I pray that you would help us. We all live in a world that's far from perfect. There's nothing perfect in it at all except you. Your love. And Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us tonight. Whether we need to change our mind, we need to realize I'm sitting on a throne that isn't mine. It belongs to God. I'm ruling my life. I must get him in the right place. God, I repent. I change my mind. This is your place. I'm getting down. I want you to be exalted. I want to be humbled. And Lord, as I am humbled, I pray that you would teach me to esteem others as more important than me. Esteem my husband or my wife, my children, their lives, the people I work with. That my opinion, my right to rule is not an issue. God's right to rule, God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, God's patience and kindness, that's the rule. Lord, help me to think right about others. And then, Lord, anything in my behavior, that though it's undetected by everyone else, if there's one in heaven, it would say, you're wrong and you won't be free till you change your mind. And Jesus, I thank you tonight for communion, this wonderful place that we can come and all of our wrongs are put right by your blood and your mercy and your forgiveness. Lord, open our hearts. We thank you for it. We praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.